Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Experio webinar on UX challenges for the front and middle office in financial services. A couple of housekeeping things. Number one, uh, we are recording today's session, so we'll send out a link. So if you have other practitioners or other friends uh, that would like to enjoy the webinar, or if you want to uh, follow up on that, we'll send that up at the end. Uh, also, as we get close towards the end, uh, there's an open QA section at the bottom of your panel. If you could suggest um, questions, we'll certainly save some time for that. Uh, with that, I'll hand it over to today's speakers, Sebastian Good and Lynn Posick. Hey, good morning, everyone or afternoon, depending upon where you are. I'm Sebastian, I'm the CEO of Xpero. Um, I've done a lot of work in financial services over the years on the technical side, and my co-founder, uh, Lynn Posick is with us. Hi, Lynn. Hey, everybody. Today, we are going to talk a little bit about who we are, if you haven't met us before, uh, some front and middle office trends that we see in our work, uh, a little bit of uh, our approach to modernizing and building applications uh, in that space, uh, particularly around uh, UX, but we will talk a little bit about product and technology challenges as well. A little bit about how analytics is upending the whole Apple cart. And if there's time, certainly uh, welcome your questions. Um, there should be a Q&A feature in your Zoom app. And um, if, if the question is appropriate, uh, for us to include during the talk. We would love to do that. If not, we'll uh, either get to them at the end or, or follow up with you separately, but certainly love to hear from you as well. So a quick introduction to Xpero. We are a professional services firm, uh, been around about 18 years. We develop uh, and design software products and data products for people. We do a lot of interesting analytics and both within our company, with startups and within big, within big companies, uh, we incubate novel ventures. We incubate new products. Uh, our, our typical uh, engagement is to go build something new for someone. That said, uh, talk a little more specifically about what we do in finance. Um, we, we build a lot of new products from the ground up. We'll, you'll be hearing a little bit about one of those today. Um, as everyone knows, in the, especially in the middle office, uh, in, in capital markets firms, there is a ton of legacy software that is great at what it does, but is 20 years old and maybe actually isn't as great as what it could be given all the new things that are happening in the space. And so we have ended up doing quite a bit of modernization work, either in conjunction with building something new inside an ecosystem or just as a conscious whole ecosystem modernization project. That's really what we'll be talking about today, primarily as we focus on front and middle office. Should add though, as a firm also in financial services, we've done quite a bit of uh, machine learning, uh, network analytics, both from a technical infrastructure and security perspective, as well as sort of research level uh, analytics. And we won't talk about it today, but I certainly welcome you to peruse some of the other webinars we've done on the topic. Uh, we have uh, some real expertise in sort of financial crimes, anti-money laundering, uh, some transactional fraud detection as well, um, building on those strengths in analytics and, uh, and workflows. We are not a financial services uh, specialized only firm. We work in a variety of industries. I think this is useful because we bring interesting patterns and insights from those uh, industries into financial services. Uh, uh, that said, it's, it's a very big part of uh, what we do. We've worked with a lot of big customers, primarily, as I uh, mentioned before, in the front and middle office, which is a big enough space itself, uh, but also uh, in, in that financial crime space. We're going to talk today mostly about UX challenges, but we are uh, a technology firm as well. We've kind of built the gamut of things across a whole variety uh, of ecosystems. Again, we are not uh, beholden to any one of those have expertise across a, a lot of places and kind of either build what we think is is right for a new venture or find a way to fit into the ecosystem uh, uh, people have. Um, today we're going to talk about uh, uh, the UX challenges that we see in the projects we faced. We will primarily show you examples from one of three places. Um, Going from right to left, uh, most specifically, uh, one of our reference customers is uh, Opendoor, who builds a really interesting many-to-many -many, uh, dark pool trading platform for U.S. Treasuries. I think they're getting a workout these days. Uh, we built that whole UX uh, and front-end experience for them, and so sometimes you'll see us talk about examples, and that's a real app. You can go call them uh, and look at. We've published a case study on it. We actually did a webinar with our friends over at OpenFin uh, on that platform in detail if you'd like to, to know more about it. 
And then the other two examples are from uh, adding a new application to an existing uh, portfolio around risk management and reporting. Um, and then uh, sort of a whole modernization effort across a suite of tools. And obviously the pictures you see there are, are not what we actually deliver to our client uh, that is proprietary to them, but there are illustrative examples uh, that sort of synthesize the kind of work we saw there and, and across other places. So uh, to kick us off, I'm going to uh, ask Lynn to join us and just talk about uh, what we're seeing happening uh, in this space that's informing the way we do our work. Awesome. Thank you for that great intro, Sebastian. So again, my name is Lynn Pozik. I'm one of the co-founders of Expiro. Uh, my background is more in product and user experience, and uh, I also spend a great deal of time uh, working in the financial sector with our lovely clients there. So um, so what we wanted to do was start off with a few uh, level sets. Um, the, the first of which is, is just kind of looking at what's going on out there, what's happening um, in front and middle office. And some of these things are things that we're experiencing, uh, and some of them are, are things um, that we're hearing you know, across the board from, from various sources. But one of the, the big themes is the blurring of lines from uh, where things stood, where there were still a lot of siloed business functions. So for example, compliance was often considered more of a back office sort of function and in, in the support that went with it. Um, and there, there was a lot of um, disconnect between some of the different tasks and the functional areas. And that's all changing and it's expedited uh, given the current situation with people working working more remotely and the need to reach across those lines easier. Uh, and so you're starting to see a shift in different tasks moving into the front office or the front office reaching um, into uh, the back office more fluidly and a lot of interoperability between those different skills. So you're seeing um, compliance information show up in OMSs, for example, um, and you're seeing um, research uh, type information move a lot faster to the middle office and the front office with risk management and predictions and, and things of that nature. With the whole focus, of course, being on better results. So then another thing that we're seeing um, is uh, in support of kind of blurring those lines and making task flow um, a little bit, um, making things more efficient um, and, and more informative, um, there's this need to kind of break down, um, in some cases, siloed data. In some cases, it could be um, walls and barriers of legacy apps and products and architectures that at one point made sense, um, but now the world has changed and, and things need to be a little bit more open and easier to exchange information. There's also a lot of um, third party information, a lot of you know data subscription services. So Bloomberg is not the only game in town anymore. There, there are a lot, depending on the business that you're in, the types of instruments that you're focused on, the work that you do, uh, right? You could be looking to bring all of these different streams of information, both in, internal, institutional with your clients, as well as these third party sources and, and making that all work and possibly making it work in the cloud, depending on where you're at on that journey. Um, another thing that's happening um, is user expectation is increasing. And this isn't just unique to finance, although it does play a role in the financial sector as well. And that is, like it or not, uh, your multi-million dollar uh, platforms and ecosystems, uh, more and more users are comparing that to the other experiences they have outside of the workplace. So they are saying, well, why can't this work as simply as, as uh, my experience on a website or another web app or with my smartphone, um, why, why should I have to uh, put up with this inefficient experience that's also impacting my ability to be effective in the results um, in the workplace? Uh, so much so that there have been a number of um, surveys that have confirmed that this, is start, this trend is actually showing up in exit interviews for employees where they're citing the software um, and they're impacting their ability to do their job well because of things like siloed information, inefficient task flows, uh, etc. So, and then uh, finally, of course, we would be remiss if we didn't uh, give a nod to what's what's happening in the world and the need for everyone um, to figure out how to make things work remotely, including things that might have been traditional in-person transactions. Um, we're seeing more uh, things like over-the-counter transactions uh, and other other things also being able now for uh, remote access and, and delivery. So now let's let's talk about a little bit of a baseline. So that's kind of a big picture of what's going on out there in front and middle office. And now let's talk about a baseline 
of approach. So often, um, whenever uh, people think about user experience, what do you think about when I say that word, right? You probably think about, well, you know, this is, this is what our um, app looks like. Here are the colors, here are the fonts. Maybe it's easy to use, maybe it's hard to use, right? So you kind of kind of have sort of a visceral reaction to, to what that means. Well, go ahead to the next slide. Well, whenever you're approaching um, any, uh, whether it's you know, a product holistically or thinking about improving your user experience, um, it's complicated, right? Um, so for the, the various reasons that we just mentioned, you know, there could be lots of, lots of data to think about, complex architecture, maybe you're in the middle of um, modernizing something legacy, maybe you're in the middle of building something new. Um, whatever it is, when you start to think about your user experience, um, it can be very complicated. There are lots of moving parts. Um, because it's complicated, we can have a temptation to get mired in the technology, right? There are lots of different distractions um, along the way. Um, so it's easy uh, for whether it's new product uh, or existing um, product, maybe a modernization play to, uh, to kind of go astray where we start to miss the mark. So one approach that we have to that is one approach that um, we have found works well um, is to take a more holistic view um, and you know, when you think about building product and you think about how that impacts your user experience, um, there's a lot of moving parts, which means there also needs to be a multi-threaded approach to address those parts. So it's not about going off into a silo with, if you have a design team with your design team, or if your um, development team um, re is responsible for your user experience, it's not about any one particular discipline or group. Um, kind of going off and, and driving that. It's really a collaborative process between disciplines, right? So we're gonna we're gonna touch on some some um, <clears throat> some deeper things here in the stack. Sebastian's gonna talk a little bit about the different moving parts of the technology and the data, the architecture, and some of the examples we're gonna talk about. But it's this collaborative experience, um, keeping your eye on the overall strategy, right? Not getting mired in the technology. What is your goal? What are the, the things that you want to move by improving your user experience? Because at the end of the day, your user experience, it's just one lever to achieve your business goals, to make your customers happy, to increase your revenue, you know, decrease your cost, improve your efficiency, right? So we got to keep our eye on the product strategy. At the same time, we need to understand the art of the possible. So it does come down to what data do we have? What uh, technology do we have? What's the speed and the rate at which we can deliver it? Um, and then also now um, thinking about intelligence. Uh, so what can we do to possibly automate? What can we do to make what we're doing more intelligent? And then finally, our third swim lane here is the user experience itself and thinking about with all this great functionality, the data that we have, the wonderful highly performant architecture and technology. Now, how can we deliver and package that experience in a meaningful way so people can access all of these great things. But we need to think about, you know, these swim lanes kind of operating in parallel. And so to dive in here a little bit more into um, the, those product and user experience uh, swim lanes, um, one of the fundamental things to understand is um, how your users think about um, data and technology. Again, it's easy to get mired in that stuff. Often it, it can require a mind shift set, right? So typically um, more of an engineering mind shift set, if that's the way your, you know, your organization might be engineering driven, um, is often you know, making sure that we get the data and the logic and the architecture and everything just right. And then we're gonna surface that into the user experience. Whereas the user's mindset is more thinking about the tasks and the things that they need to accomplish with a piece of technology, right? And hopefully what they need is there when they reach down for it, right? Hopefully it has the data that they want and it can um, deliver um, the answers that might be uh, embedded in the logic and in the architecture and the technology there, right? So very different models um, and successful products um, or are going to address um, both mental models. Um, and, you know, one way to think about your user experience is if you explode it out, it's got all these different things that need to work in concerts. The swim lanes I just talked about are one representation, um, but there are other things in there too, right? So with the most, uh, the, the baseline layer, 
most foundational is understanding, remembering who your user audience is, who is it today? Maybe you're also targeting a Greenfield user audience with um, your project. You know, who is that Greenfield user audience that you need to think about? What do they need it to do? What data and architecture is going to enable that to happen. Those orange layers there are the, the base. And then as you go upward in the stack, right, then we start to talk about how users are going to access things. Things need to be easy to use, make sense, and also hopefully embody your brand, look professional, look great. The bottom of that stack, that orange layer, is your business case. That is the value that your technology is bringing to your customers and to the market, right? If you don't nail that, those blue layers on top, it's like moving deck chairs on the Titanic, right? You can move them around to make it look as pretty as you want, but there's a good chance you've, you've built the beautiful wrong thing uh, that doesn't provide the value that your market is looking for. So uh, again, thinking about your users, very critical. We'll talk more about that as we move through, but we want to just not only think about making things easy to use, we want to be thinking about addressing the value that different constituents want to receive um, in using your technology and how they think about it. So there are lots of, uh, we, gosh, we could give a whole day, you know, seminar on lots of different techniques for getting inside the heads of end users and trying to understand their approach and how they think about things. Um, but being able to dig in, um, and the, the, the key here is being able to dig in and sort of unpack how your user thinks about it. This is an example of just kind of a, a, a mapping flow of one flow for how, the, how they might approach a particular task, but map it out and really dig in there and think about it. Um, it, it get your users to vocalize how they think about the task, not necessarily the most optimal path uh, with regard to how you might want to engineer the product. And then further, go ahead and use the next ten. slide, please. Um, and then further, um, you know, whenever you're um, getting feedback, and we'll show some examples of this, but um, you want to be listening not just for those, those usability items of, oh, the button should be blue and on the top right. What we want to also validate, is it useful, right? So that's great if we uh, know that we have a usability improvement, but what are we missing? Um, what would make it more valuable? Um, maybe it's a little piece of content. Maybe it's a whole set of functionality. And then finally, go ahead to the next slide, please. And then finally, um, you know, we want to validate big ticket things as well, right? Um, and again, we'll talk about this a little bit with some of the, the subsequent examples, but we're not just looking for, um, you know, how easy is it to use? We're also trying to understand the overall value, right? And there are ways that even with small numbers of uh, users, uh, you can you can uh, capture that and quantify it. So these are a couple of examples where you could ask specifically about the usefulness or utility of a particular feature um, or the overall utility of an app. And even, again, you might talk to five to 10 uh, users. Uh, you could still quantify that with a value to understand just how ready your product is to go to market. Are you providing the right value? And is it easy to use? Uh, and then finally, you know, the more that you can do up front, we're not talking waterfall here, we're still talking about being agile and, and fitting into that incremental cycle. Um, but the more that you can do uh, before you start coding in many cases, uh, you know, the better off you're gonna be. It's a lot easier to iterate and you're gonna see a lot higher ROI on your investment. And it's gonna decrease um, your development burden later. There's always this temptation, particularly with agile, as we can get to software faster to just go ahead and code it and change it later. Um, but a lot of these systems are sufficiently complicated enough uh, that if you get too deep, you know, you're going to incur more costs later rather than doing some of these techniques up front. So I now would we certainly talk say that someone who sits on the technology side, I can appreciate how much cheaper it is to resketch something on a whiteboard or mm -hmm. move around some widgets on a page uh, than it is to, you know, say, oh, shoot we need a whole new view in the database and a thing and another thing and another thing <laughs> to address the thing the user just told us. It, it's so much cheaper to address it up front. Yep, absolutely. And again, up front doesn't mean waterfall. It just means staying ahead of that incremental development cycle. So you're just a little bit up front. You don't, you don't want to go back to waterfall where, uh, you know, then, then you're, you could be dealing with stale requirements, which is a whole nother problem. 
Okay, so now we're going to get into a few examples about um, particular different types of challenges um, that, that are often encountered in front and middle office that will impact your product UX and your technology. So highlighted here, um, the, the, the salient point are the things in blue on the right. Um, there are lots of different um, cases in finance. Um, today, we're going to touch primarily on front office cases around trading and a little bit on portfolio optimization and a little bit of ML driven recommendations um, and some modernization examples and a little bit around um, compliance. We recognize it's a great big world out there in front and middle office, um, but these are the things that we're going to talk about today. So. Um, Often, uh, so one example is, is modernization. Um, often when we're coming into a modernization situation, uh, people are landing on the left here where they you know, have a lot of these um, characteristics that we were just talking about, where we have some, a lot of siloed disconnected information. Um, we often have um, a legacy architecture burden that inhibits some different things that we can do. Um, users uh, may be addicted to nightly reports in some cases and not want their cheese moved. Um, in other cases, they very much are interested in being able to see information in different ways and more in a real time. And so you got to mitigate user expectations and migrating them on the journey as well. Um, but where people want to get to, um, whether they're modernizing or often you know, building new product, um, is we're talking about things like fast and easy access to analytics and information rather than always uh, having to wait um, for a scheduled report or something to run. Very fast uh, trades and reconciliation. Um, and depending on the instrument, your reconciliation times and you know, trade settlement might vary depending on the complexity there. Um, but in, in the experience, we want it to be highly performant to support whatever that instrument can, can, um, can allow for. Um, and then things like visibility um, and being able to look at a wide swath of information across portfolios. <clears throat> so along those lines, um, I'm gonna talk first about visibility. Uh, this is a common thing that comes up, uh, whether we're looking at new product or, or modernization efforts um, in both the front and the middle office. Um, a lot of information, as we've said, uh, data, whether it's um, internal or third party data comes in and it can be, it's often stored in a way, unfortunately, where information becomes siloed, sometimes because of the data, sometimes it has to do with access privileges or the, the legacy uh, structure of an application where unnecessarily so, although I might have access to many portfolios, I can't see <laughs> an aggregate view across all of them because of the way the privileges have been set up over time. Um, but what this means is often we're missing out on opportunities because users are spending so much time having to simply access and assimilate the information that they need um, that that um, you know it's we're not as productive as we could be and we're missing out on on revenue opportunities so with the the way that the the data is often structured um, kind of going down down that path here for a minute uh, as it regards to visibility um, we're often talking about very deep data taxonomies and depending on the types of portfolios and the instruments that they contain your mileage might vary um, but we could be talking about you know some some very deep taxonomies here um, and what we want to do um, is allow the user um, to be able to, uh, privileges permitted, access across these different uh, levels of taxonomy very fluidly. We want architecture that can support that. We want data stores that are supporting that. And we want an experience um, that allows users to sift, sort, filter through information very fluidly in a dynamic user experience to provide that visibility. So, you know, way to think about this is in one query in your experience, not an overnight query, but a real-time query, right? You might want to filter and sort, in essence, across assets, um, different um, tranches of criteria, it could be in this case, you know, credit rating example, um, into different types of instruments and assets across a variety of portfolios. So in these, yeah, and then going across all those, that depth can be a real hurdle to visibility. Um, 
Another hurdle can be where the data is coming from um, and not just um, necessarily siloed in the way that it's stored, um, but also, uh, you know, siloed in some, some legacy processes and ways of doing things. So there can be a lot of information still stored in Excel and a lot of collaboration happening there, right? How do we update the process or um, automate the process, right? So that we get that information um, feeding in on, uh, you know, on a real-time basis where we need it. Maybe we have things still coming out of nightly reports, right? So interoperability um, and breaking down those silos to improve visibility um, is really a key fundamental um, to uh, improving performance on the front office. And here, this is just an example, a um, sanitized example of a, um, a, a dashboard experience um, that has a little bit of information from an OMS, um, some high-level reports, some real-time information on the current state of the liquidity across um, different portfolios. So another thing, in addition to visibility, um, is facilitating complex workflows. And I started to mention that as, as I was talking about visibility there with uh, you know, things like uh, manual processes around Excel or batch reporting. So you get into this space, go to the next slide, please. So you get into, in it, it, with sometimes uh, within trying to improve visibility, sometimes just simply making things more efficient, you know, run into a lot of complex workflows where uh, to be able to understand you know, maybe a simple reconciliation number or something that's going to drive my decision making. Um, I've got to go through lots of hops or other people, I'm waiting on other people or processes to run to go through lots of hops. Sometimes it means I need to deal with the legacy infrastructure where I'm hopping between different applications um, and I'm, you know, going down, you know, 20 clicks to be able to get to a particular piece of information I need. Sometimes I'm doing double data entry. Um, that, that can also be, a, that could be really bad for a variety of reasons. And in addition to being inefficient, it can be highly error prone. Uh, and then talking about earlier, I mentioned user expectation shifting. Um, these complex workflows where there is an unnecessarily steep learning curves is one of the big things that turns off next generation users. Uh, it's is uh, having to, to deal with this and, and ramp on these, these things that don't maybe make sense. They're left over from lots of different legacy systems um, and, and hops. So they're very turned off by that. And that can be a problem. Maybe internally, you can mitigate that and people simply have to learn it. But with your customers, when you're talking about next generation, this expectation that they're going to ramp up on a steep learning curve of kind of this very complex, unnecessarily complex workflow uh, can be a real turnoff um, for sales as well. So uh, as, I, as I was mentioning, um, in addition to the inefficiency factor, it can also be very costly due to human error. So the more complex the workflow, that steep learning curve, uh, the more likelihood of human error of missing a step, um, as well as there can be a lot of double data entry, uh, it, which can also be very error prone and cause tremendous damage um, in terms of uh, you know, the outcome of that process riddled with errors. So a better way, uh, if we go back to what we were talking about earlier, considering our baseline is getting back to, uh, you know, let's put that complex workflow in a box for a minute and get back to, well, what was the goal? What is the user's goal? Why do they do this 20 clicks on a routine basis? What is their goal in doing so? Who is doing it? And, and now we could start to look at what would be a better way. Uh, and I like to simplify that and say, what should we keep? What should we, you know, as in keep as is, what do we keep but we need to improve upon? And what do we lose? So often when we're talking particularly about legacy stuff, not new products so much, people forget to ask the question of what can we lose, <laughs> right? There, there can be a lot of things lurking in the technology that were put in for one customer that may not need that feature anymore or they may not even be a customer anymore, right? And yet we continue to forward that technology and QC that code all the time and play it forward. Um, and sometimes this happens because we lack the ability to understand what people are using. A lot of legacy systems don't unfortunately have great tagging, um, whereas a, as, as a um, want a business or product owner where you could get in there and really kind of understand what people are using. So it's important uh, to be able to get in there 
um, get out of the building with your real customers and your users, not just um, what your internal experts think uh, people are, are using and how they want it to work, and really think about how they approach a particular uh, workflow, right? Which bits are they using? Which bits would they like to have simplified? Which bits should go away? And this, again, this is, I mentioned this earlier, a simple mapping exercise where you kind of go through step-by-step step here and understand how the user thinks about it um, and then the different steps they go through. And, and uh, next slide, please. And then what you want to do is distill that down and we've really simplified here, but let's say that, um, one of your users goals in some complex workflow is to be able to understand maybe what their buying power is right so uh, if we're thinking about we have to maybe look at uh, if i'm a if i'm a you know portfolio manager or trader i want to understand well what could i what could i buy that day well what can i trade what can i do we start to look at these workflows and break them down what things could we automate out of the use what the user says, oh, I still need this, right? This is valuable. This really plays into me being able to calculate, in this case, my buying power. Well, what of those steps could we automate? What of those steps could we maybe improve our architecture, our data storage to be able to pre-run things and hold them? Maybe that is something we do overnight. Maybe it's something we continuously do real time. Um, and then also think about, when does perfection matter? And we see this a ton in financial sector. Of course, it, there are many cases where it makes sense to be able to reconcile things down to the, the, the penny, right? And we've got to do it. And that really matters. Sometimes we just need an order of magnitude and we can simplify things by being close enough, right? Someone wants to understand order of magnitude. What is my buying power, right? Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean down to the nickel because I'm going to leave some buffer in there anyway, right? Um, so being able to under, sufficiently understand what users want to do, what they're getting out of it, um, and then breaking it up and thinking about ways to apply all of these different possible techniques that are available today um, to simplify that. Okay, keep going, please. Uh, and so then if you, if you do that, you know, sometimes you might take a very complex workflow and be able to distill it down into something very simple. This is an example um, of a case where we did just that and we looked at a very complicated workflow. There were pieces of it that were automated. There were pieces of it um, that we were able to lose that simply didn't matter for the majority of the customers in terms of their reconciliation processes. Um, and then there were, there were some things where in certain cases, we actually didn't need to have it be um, totally perfect. Um, a reasonable order of magnitude um, made sense. And so we're able to distill it down and rather than on a nightly report basis, be able to offer this information nearly real time by going through that process. Um, and then further, um, another thing to think about um, in, in something like this is how that piece of information could interact with a broader ecosystem of things, right? So nothing stands alone. So in this case, if I'm interested in my buying power, maybe I also have my, you know, my OMS and my blotter and I have my Excel and I have lots of other things running, right? Um, so sometimes the, the quote unquote real timing nature um, might be about automating things um, that are in that ecosystem a little bit more real time. So this example, if you can go to the next slide here. So the, in this example, um, we're using a, a little piece of technology uh, called OpenFin that enables uh, interoperability between um, both legacy and modern systems to be able to have them um, interoperate real time. So if I'm updating information in Excel um, and that is connected to my little widget over here, um, we're going to see those two things interact real time, update to Excel, and you're gonna see that reflected in my widget and vice versa. So if I have an OMS where I've now gone ahead and placed some orders, um, I can now real time see that update um, in my, my total. So and so uh, point there, when we're talking about workflows, once you simplify these complex workflows, sometimes you need to then th go back and think about, well, the outcome of that now, how does it play into the broader ecosystem? And what are my um, abilities to make that interoperate a little bit better with the greater ecosystem? Cool, thanks, Lynn. So, 
in, in that vein of taking a lot of existing applications and figuring out how to simplify them, um, one of the one of the most practical paths that that people take in conjunction with others is the first one we're going to talk about with some of these tech considerations, which is desktop integration via communication. That's the first one on the left there. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about some of the things that we face when we do visual design uplifts, when we look to modernize the whole platform and, and some of what it means to integrate sort of more real time data rather than those those nightly SQL reports. But if I'm taking that big spider web of uh, process and trying to turn it into that you know, uh, sim simplified task flow. Uh, I may want to try to do that first just by integrating my existing applications. And, and, and why is that? Um, the, the way things have been built over the last 20 years, most front office and middle office desks are littered with hundreds or at least dozens of applications. And in fact, you go to any of the big software firms or internal toolkits that people use and they'll, they'll call it one name, but when you ask them what's inside it, they say, well, actually it's 24 separate little apps or it's six apps that have, you know, 500 screens between them. And each of them is a nice thing that was built in good faith and is useful or it wouldn't still be there. There's nothing really wrong with them, but sort of in aggregate, uh, you find tons of low productivity because of the, the clicking and pasting. And on when I highlight the security of my LMS, it doesn't show up over here in this other thing that I'm working with, uh, file imports, exports. So, those are the trends that are getting people to try to keep use out of the existing apps, but try to simplify these workflows. And the challenges we see from a technology side when we're trying to bring that to life, uh, I, I list here. One, you've got you know some .NET apps, you've got some Java apps, you've got a web app, you've got a, a who knows what, a, a variety of things that you've been building internally or purchased externally. Well, if you want them to coordinate, if you wanna coordinate a workflow across them, you need some communication protocol that that spans them. Uh, again, Lynn uh, mentioned a, a development partner of ours called OpenFin that has a nice piece of technology that lets you do that on the desktop. Um, that is not the only answer, it's a nice answer, but you need to get them talking to each other somehow, either at the data level or at the UI level. You need to do the work that Lynn has lined up, the service design, to figure out what's worth coordinating. Um, you need to be able to actually deploy your stuff out to the tool. Uh, and then finally, uh, I, I call it this uh, data exchange mud puddle, which is often what's invisible to the product uh, team and the technical team is all the data exchange people are doing outside of your systems. And by data exchange, let's be honest, I usually mean Excel. Someone is exporting a report, they're pasting it into somewhere, they have their own special thing that, that you know, merges their three reports or changes the units of measure or whatever, uh, and then and then shoves it back. And so even if you are able to sort of gracefully map out a, a simpler workflow, you face challenges in designing these communication and data and data exchange protocols uh, between the different tools. And, and typically what that looks like from a technical perspective is, look, I've got two or you know, 10 or 100 uh, separate applications, each doing their own thing. And your first step is, can I build a common desktop um, oriented environment that lets me coordinate a workflow across them with messages. Sometimes the messages could be exchanged on the back end. Something sometimes they can be exchanged in in the uh, in the front end. And can I manage the workspace so that I admit yes, it does take Jimmy seven applications to come up with um, you know buying power. But we've at least taken the first step of making those applications. Uh, uh, all work in the same way so that it's a three-step process instead of a 20-step process. Or we've simplified the data exchange so that we don't have to use two of them. Um, and we do that without rewriting the applications. We do that with uh, sort of communication across the top of them. Um, it's a second thing that usually happens when someone says, I need to upgrade my uh, legacy applications is that they want a design uplift. Uh, meaning, you know, even though there's nothing really wrong with that old VB application, well, gosh, it looks like a VB application and we're kind of embarrassed to show it to our customers at this point. Uh, or to Lynn's point on an earlier slide, there's just so many clicks and checks that have been added over the years, it is actually hard to use. So can we make it just look better uh, even if we don't, you know, radically uh, try to modernize our whole platform? 
Uh, so, you know, th these things are driven by uh, often because more and more of these tools are not just internally facing. We're inviting our clients into the middle office or we're exposing the same tools we're using to them. I mean, you see this in the public space too, right? More and more often when you call into an airline or a brokerage or something, those guys are using all the same tools you are. They've just been trained in how to use them. And then this it's more and more common. Um, and so really the, the challenges you face here is that, you know, doing these, these updates in existing applications can be hard and doing incremental rewrites, let's say on a VB platform or a .NET platform may not be ultimately aligned with a further goal you have like a web app. So it, it, it's really a challenge to try to keep it uh, very contained. And the, the biggest and most important thing, I should probably bold uh, uh, two of these slides, not one of them. It's bigger than it looks. What we hear over and over again is a bunch of the business logic is in the UI. So from a technology perspective, you're like, oh, yeah, I've got databases and services and I've got all that. So what I just need to do is rip out my old VB code, take a fresh look and build it as a web app. Well, every team that's ever done that when they've started sort of the demolition work on the old VB or C++ or whatever it is, has discovered by golly, you know, there's tens of thousands of lines of interesting logic about aggregation and compliance and checks uh, sitting inside what was the quote unquote UI. Uh, and so, you know, th there's no clean answer to what you do with that. You just need to be very aware of it and, and have a plan to recover that logic. Are you gonna keep it and, you know, port it to JavaScript or just keep it in .NET and move on? Are you going to move it into some new stored procedures? I mean, there are a lot of good answers. Uh, but you need to be aware it's there. It often makes the project look a lot bigger than you thought it was. Uh, and then and then finally, one of the biggest challenge is uh, often the new expectations of a better looking application involve performance and the sort of composability and alertability that, that Lynn was uh, showing in some earlier slides. And the databases just don't support it really easily, right? The distance between a uh, a SQL procedure that runs once a night to show you top 10 collection issues. The difference, the distance between that and a nice streamlined dashboard where I can search and be immediately highlighted to, you know, to look at any individual accounts, uh, purchasing power or uh, uh, compliance uh, problems is big, right? Um, the, the existing service may not support it. So you get this, this mental model in some of these technical uplifts where you say, yeah, we just need to kind of slap some new colors and paint on the UI and we already have the data services. And in fact, it's so much bigger than you think because the UI contained half your logic and the data services, which there's nothing wrong with, are not uh, set up to either run the queries or run them quickly enough to match kind of the, the expectations that are gonna go along with that better looking uh, UI. And so typically what we see is someone presents this sort of like client server view. And what we say is you almost certainly need to add yet another service layer, and of course this is uh, about a cartoon here, uh, often there's integration with other systems that bring the search or alert or real-time nature that is expected uh, when you do that visual design uplift. Uh, and, and finally, uh, what I, I mentioned this before, but um, you know, the flip side of this is when people see old software, old looking software, they may assume the algorithms are outdated. When they see new looking software, they're going to assume it's better. And that's a two edged sword. Your old stuff, frankly, may have the better uh, code in it because it's been battle tested for 10 years. The new stuff is probably going to be rushing to keep up in some key ways, but will have expectations. And so you've got to manage sort of the technical expectations on both sides. You got to realize that the new shiny thing is going to need some better back-end horsepower to make the expectations work. And you got to recognize that, you know, what your customers perceive as the old beat-up thing actually contains tons of gems in it that your technical team needs to be sure uh, to be able to move forward in, into the new world. Um, a, a third category of, of technical uh, issues we see when we do this work is specifically when, when a team says, we want to modernize our whole ecosystem. So six apps at once, uh, for instance. Um, and the, the trends we see here is that, you know, just fixing one of them doesn't solve the usability problems. You, you often have to fix multiple of them at once because the workflows um, uh, across multiple applications. And increasingly, it's worth asking whether you're having the right conversation on the right device. You know, can someone approve a wire transfer on their phone, you know, on their mobile app with a button? You know, five years ago, people laughed. Oh, of course, you can never do that. No one's going to place a trade while they're at lunch. But 
these things are changing, right? Uh, and there's watches and phones and tablets and people with 10 screens and people with one screen. Uh, and, and there's a conversation to be had about uh, how that should be. And so what we find are the biggest challenges here is that teams reimagining a large platform often enter sort of a technology fascination phase, which can be deadly. Um, they say, oh, we got to modernize it all. So let's go get a bunch of Kubernetes and let's build a bunch of microservices and all that old C++ code is clearly wrong because we're going to build it all in, you know, fresh stack of the day. Look, we're technologists. We like fresh stacks of the day and think they, you know, bring value or they wouldn't exist. But it's easy to just spin for four or five months building things that don't actually deliver ultimate end customer value before you address the technical, excuse me, the, the, the design uh, uh, challenges that, that Lynn was talking about earlier. And, you know, the technical team can easily just go fix the grids. They can just go, you know, make the window management better, fix that one bug they've always liked without looking at it uh, as a whole platform. And so what, what we see here is in a, you know, from an architecture cartoon perspective, in a whole ecosystem view, you're going to have web apps, you're going to have legacy desktop apps, you're going to have all kinds of databases, data warehouses, data services, and you're going to need to find a way to bring all of those uh, together, recognizing the value that's kind of hiding uh, inside each one. And that's really hard. And like I said, I think the primary challenge we see, uh, besides that it's hard, and that's just hard work, we all, we all do it together, is that as much as me, the technology has, technologist hates to say this, if you don't dive in from a design perspective, you're just going to spin in a circle for months <laughs> on the technology side of things. You have to lay out the product strategy and, and design uh, uh, updates. And that generally kind of provides the engine that can pull all the technical stuff in line. You can look at something and say, oh, yeah, this looks immensely complicated from a technical perspective. And, and it'll stay that way because that's the truth. But here's where we can start because we all agree this set of personas, this set of users is the most important. And we can draw a line through the whole system and, and modernize that and start pulling it. And as you pull that thread, you eventually get the whole system in behind you piece by piece. Otherwise, you just frankly uh, struggle with where to start. Um, Another key technical challenge that we find when we do this work is performance. Uh, I like to say performance is my favorite UX feature, uh, probably because it's the only one I directly influence as a technologist, because uh, I don't draw the screens. But um, often what happens in this industry, and this is not the only one, but financial, service is, financial services uh, is particularly addicted to what we call the super grid pattern. Um, and for good reason, because a grid is a really dense, really smart way to present the kind of data we work with day to day, bunches of securities or positions or what have you. And from a technical perspective, what's often been done is that these applications have just shoved a ton of data to a desktop app, which being a desktop app has access to lots of performance and just let the grid sort it out. Features are often defined as, oh yeah, let's make a user definable column and let's make a sortable column. And that will satisfy these 15 users. And it may, and it probably does. And there's some cases where that's important. But to Lynn's point earlier, if you don't understand why they're doing that, if they're just creating a user defined column of purchasing power and sorting by purchasing power, and what they really want to know is purchasing power because they've been in six other spreadsheets all morning, you adding that feature to that super grid, you know, didn't really solve the problem. And so what, what we see is, is, is two things. One, grids being abused in a sense by, you know, it can deliver a feature, but should it? Uh, and secondly, a lack of depth on the technical team at how to make these grids performant because they, they, they tend to need to be really fast and, and searchable and Often, as data volumes get bigger and as the number of data sources you're using gets bigger, the queries you need, the things the technical team needs the backend systems to do in order to power these grids, um, stress out the services that already exist. So someone built a, a stored procedure 10 years ago and the grids have been working on it ever since. Once you reimagine it, you may need more better queries, more better search indexes, more better many things uh, to make this thing work the way, uh, the, the work the way people expect. Um, we find these uh, across lots of industries um, and another interesting challenge is that often the grid is actually a, a nice little application called Excel 
And so where you can get interop with Excel and where you can get these grids to behave the same across multiple different applications, um, you can and you should. And talk to any web developer for more than an hour about this problem and they'll tell you how they once lost a month of their life figuring out which grid component they were even going to use. So as silly as it sounds to harp on grids, one of the first things that we do when we enter any of these projects is, is do a real assessment of them, what capabilities they need and which kind of control uh, we want to go use for it because no matter what the application, half the screens are going to have a super grid on them. Um, and, and Lynn, I think um, there was some uh, space here for you to talk a little bit about how these grids interact with uh, with everything else. Yeah, for sure. Thanks. Um, so, uh, you know, building on what Sebastian said, sometimes, um, yes, you might be pulling information from, let's say, an Excel sheet or whatever, but sometimes just, you know, giving the user just um, the tiniest um, bit of information can really increase the value and allowing them to co-visualize information. In this case, in a data grid, uh, we're using that as an example, but it might not just be a data grid. Uh, and here, so one of the things we're calling it is that, that little icon over on the left, um, that's an alert that says, hey, um, there's something going on in, in the context of this particular grid with the compliance of some instruments that are associated with this particular holding. So you should probably go and check that out. So I can right there in the context of other work that I'm doing, I can I get that nice interoperability so that I have an idea of something else that's going on that normally I might have had to go into a whole nother app to even see in the context of, of my natural workflow, I can get that information. That icon is actually a very simple example of co-visualizing um, information in a data grid and bring that information in from different sources. Um, and some other examples, um, you could imagine um, visualization. So we've got a simple bar chart and a, a pie chart here. Um, but similarly, uh, you know, selecting things in the data grid and then being able to visualize them real time, right? So maybe I select some things in my data grid and it lights up my pie chart or my bar chart. And those are just some simple examples. But taking information in a tabular format and then being able to co-visualize it in some other way can also be very powerful. And when you have the architecture uh, underneath um, that enables that high performance, um, you, can, you can do that and you know, figuring out what they, which things you do in the browser, which things you do in the server, all, of, all that kind of stuff. But, and, and these could be multiple panels of one kind of comprehensively modernized or greenfield application, or you can imagine these being different applications, right? And that gets to a concrete example of where some of this messaging happens. So I have application X, I select the, the grid cells in it, application Y snaps to and shows me, you know, it's relevant workflow focusing on those things, even though that seems small. It can be a little bit of a technical challenge to go implement across diverse apps. It's a thing you can do that's cheaper than rewriting both apps. Absolutely. And if you think about, you know, in a modernization situation where that pie chart might be something that you're, you see once every 24 hours, if you're lucky, out of a batch report, right? Now, what if we, ha we can have access to this, you know, information in tabular format, but we can real time now light it up and not have to wait for that report anymore. So to Sebastian's point, this interoperability of both legacy um, and, and more modern systems. So. Um, let's keep going here. Yeah, so the the uh, the last thing that we wanted to cover off on is a trend that we see a lot is starting to layer in more intelligent analytics and tooling. So we're talking about things um, in the realm of um, sometimes still deterministic algorithms. Sometimes we're talking about machine learn learning driven algorithms um, and other various forms of, of adaptable AI. Um, what we're focused on here today, there, there's, there's been a lot of um, intelligence added to the simpler cases. Um, and so that being more of the, the typical um, trading of simple equities and, and other forms. Um, but I wanted to talk here about, you know, when you get into front office and middle office and more complex financial instruments, some, of, some, some examples on that. So the fundamental challenge is still the same, where we're talking about just an avalanche of data outstripping human capacity and the algorithms for the most part being able to improve the overall performance um, uh, if we get them right. Um, so as things get more complex though, depending on the type of instrument you have, um, there are um, intelligent solutions now kind of creeping into those spaces. Um, even, you know, <clears throat> talking about things that still are somewhat um, 
manual like over the counter transactions and so forth. Um, but you know, you you're kind of find yourself probably in one of these postures where you're either forced into doing something as a defense um, or you spot some opportunities and maybe you've already kind of tried this out in your organization by bringing some data science and some machine learning into the mix, possibly to spot opportunities. Again, this is inc that would be increasing visibility through um, machine learning um, or optimizing. You know, maybe you can get so far still with your more deterministic and manual processes, but you'd like the machine learning to tweak that last little bit. So we're going to show you an example here of um, so this would this would be an example of uh, machine learning driven recommendations for a more complex financial instrument like in this case I think we have a CLO here um, and the, the salient point here is we've got um, not just a simple okay you know you know uh, purchase uh, we recommend that you purchase this this equity it's looking at multiple um, axes in concert here. So if we purchase this, will we still be in compliance? If we wanna purchase this and we wanna purchase a certain amount of it, what would we have to sell in order to keep things in compliance and balanced, right? So <clears throat> these are the kinds of things that are possible now um, with intelligent um, analytics, uh, particularly machine learning. Uh, to be able to drive recommendations like this and be able to mitigate the compliance risks. And then further, um, last thing I want to touch on here around this, um, the more complex your instrument, and so the more sort of complex that the overall algorithms need to be in the models, um, it becomes very important to be able to consider how you're going to adapt those algorithms. Is it merely enough over time um, to be able to, um, you know, kind of uh, just just tweak the models from a data science standpoint? Maybe. Um, but what we found is things really ratchet up in the, the complexity, um, introducing more of this co-learning human in the loop um, feedback trip um, with your intelligent recommendations um, and analytics can really impact the overall accuracy um, and it, of, of the, uh, the recommendations and the analytics that you're seeing. And so the way this works is it could be something as simple as here, we have a call out here on um, a recommendation um, of a transaction. Every time the user chooses to accept or dismiss, that's feeding, sending feedback um, into our model. Um, we could even, we don't have it depicted here, but we could even expand it further. And depending on the situation, the user could, ex could check a few boxes to say why they're choosing to accept or dismiss something um, or set thresholds as to what to accept or dismiss. And those thresholds then get fed back into the model. So getting this, this co-learning loop happening where algorithms are learning from humans and the recommendations and <clears throat> analytics get better over time so that humans can make better informed decisions and are being helped by the algorithms um, in this loop that, that goes around to improve the overall accuracy of your system. And it looks something like this is what, I, what I've been describing here. Cool, so uh, I, I know we're short on time, but the, the last uh, tech challenge topic uh, I wanna cover here is just what bringing those analytics in tends to mean. Uh, what, what the biggest technical challenge we've seen is that the analytics results that people are bringing into these workflows are often hard to integrate because they've been developed on a different stack. And I know that sounds trivial, but you know, here's a whole web development database kind of architecture that's been uh, so typical for many years. Uh, and then to, to oversimplify a bit, then there's a bunch of kids that are giving you Python notebooks. Um, or there's a huge streaming message bus that's coming out of some real-time system or subscription that is sort of fundamentally incompatible with a nightly batch uh, reporting that a lot of these systems are based on. And so uh, I don't want to get into depth on that, but we've done some interesting work for how can I deploy some of that notebook code? How can I refactor some of these uh, queries and applications around being real-time? Uh, as opposed to being batch oriented. And it, it really requires a, a different perspective than the push button and query. Um, and, and we often see this because we don't just wanna redesign an application to work smoother, that's important. We often can reimagine the application by you know, deprecating whole parts of it for a smart analytic workflow or, or awakening new personas completely because of the kind of recommendations and, and data that we have. So, um, 
we want to invite you guys to um, uh, contact us about how you can start or continue your journeys. You know, these are some of the things we talked about today. Uh, often you can get started um, with us. Uh, often we people come ask us, gosh, how do I even get started? Um, if I want to do this, you know, how can I figure out whether, you know, you can help me? Uh, one of the most common things we do is just start with a, uh, a few weeks uh, engagement and really take this rubric that we've gone through today and kind of apply it to your existing application. Often it's modernization. Uh, sometimes it's a new app, but you know, no app really is naked in this world. It sits inside an ecosystem of, of all kinds of other stuff uh, and, and, and assess where you are on these journeys and which of these you know, challenges are most important to you and at least start giving you or the combined us a roadmap for for how we attack that. So hopefully uh, walking through this rubric uh, has been useful to you guys. Um, please reach out to us if you have uh, any questions or thoughts. Our emails are there. Um, we'd love to hear from you. All right. So as we come to a close, um, if you have any questions, go ahead and uh, enter those in the QA box. Uh, and just as a reminder, uh, it, uh, we are recording today's session. We will post uh, the um, the version out online and you'll get an email here shortly. Um, it looks like I have one question that came in here. Uh, it says, we're uh, in the front office market. We're not a huge company. Um, what you've discussed today, we're using a couple of older systems. Uh, your assessment, uh, would that work for a company like us or is it for bigger companies? That's a good question. I mean, if you take every single one of these challenges and opportunities and, and mash them up, then you then you get a big you you think you're at a big company. But we've we've seen these challenges across the board. There's not there's nothing here that doesn't exist in just a simple you know ten year old uh, application or two smaller apps that need to be integrated or a whole opportunity that popped up because you've made an acquisition or because you've uh, uncovered a new kind of persona or you're trying to go to market. So. Yeah, that is a great question. I think it's easy to imagine all this stuff happening all at once and only being applicable if there's, you know, 700 apps and 15 managing directors and 400 VPs involved. But this framework and these sets of challenges we've seen from, you know, little three man development gigs all the way up to multi year modernization efforts. Okay. Uh, I don't see any other questions out in the uh, queue here. Uh, so if there are any other questions, we've got a quick, quick window here. Uh, if not, uh, please reach, uh, reach out to us as Sebastian and Lynn's contact information is here. Uh, and again, we'll send out the recording. Thank you so much for the time today. Thanks, everyone. Hope to talk Thank to you soon. Bye-bye.